I am so excited because I've never done a panel with picture editors, so this is a first for me. I thought we could start with everyone going around and giving us a quick synopsis, like 30 seconds, of the film that you are that you have in the festival this year. So we can start with you, Eamon. Um, so I edited uh, Once for Brothers, Robbie Robertson and the band, and it basically chronicles uh, Robbie Robertson's life uh, through his collaboration with Bob Dylan, through the band, Last Waltz, and uh, sort of is capped off by a, a scene or two of his current work uh, on his new album. My name is uh, Jorge, and I did the Castle on the Ground. It's Joey Klein's second feature, and it's about the, the opioid crisis, the opioid epi epidemic, and it's basically about the, these two people that meet it, uh, their neighbors, and they're dealing in their own way with the addiction and codependency. Uh, I'm Susan, and I edited Guest of Honor and summarizing an Adam McGoin film in 30 seconds. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, it's a story about a father and daughter. It's um, a mystery. Uh, the daughter has, uh, is, is atoning for something that happened in her past, and her father is... Um, uh, it's a story about his life as well. <laughs> yeah, that's the best I can do <laughs> in 30 you. seconds. That's good. that's good. My name is Kelly Dixon, um, and I uh, edited The Goldfinch, which is an adaptation of Donna Tartt's novel, uh, Pulitzer novel. Um, it is about uh, so many things. It's a big metaphor. <laughs> um, but uh, it's about a, a young boy who loses his mother in a very tragic um, event, I can't say much. Um, it's, he loses his mother in a very tragic event, and it's how he, how that event manifests itself uh, through his uh, teens and through his life as a twenty-something-year-old. You guys are great. I've had to read the synopses of all those films, and those were really great synopses. So thank you. <laughs> um, I'm so curious because when I was growing up, and people would be like, "What do you want to be when you're an adult?" They would say things like, "Do you want to be a lawyer? Do you want to be an actor? Do you want to be a doctor?" No one said, do you want to be a film editor? So I'm just wondering how you came to this career. Kelly, when did you know that you wanted to be an editor? <laughs> I'm going to try and make this very short, but I, I didn't. I, I wanted to write ad copy. I really wanted to be in advertising, and I couldn't get in after college. And, and I thought that any, only people whose parents worked in the film industry could be in the film industry. Um, I was a journalism major, so I'd done a little bit of editing news in college. And um, I started as a production assistant, and I started hanging out in editing. And the editors there taught me how to use the system, and then they would give me scenes to cut. And I just started doing it, and they would give me notes. And I, they said I was pretty good at it, so that was it. <laughs> I didn't go to film school. Okay. Did it, okay. So, if, oh, if people want to share for that. That's great. That's great. <laughs> For the rest of the panel, when was your moment of clarity when you realized film editing was your, your path, your journey? Well, I did go to film school, sorry. Yes! <laughs> I did go to film school, yeah, woo! <laughs> Which mostly just gave me some really great connections for when I got out into the industry. It's a great plug for film school. Um, but we, we made movies, we made little 16 mil movies and uh, wrote and directed and cut them on a Steenbeck or a Moviola. And uh, so that was where I really learned that um, the, the real much of the real storytelling happened and just the, what, what you could, uh, how much you could affect the, this, the presentation of the narrative. And I thought it was just magical. And so um, I think in a way I, I, I continue to want to do it to learn more about um, storytelling and the whole process of storytelling in film. And then it just kind of stuck. For me, also, I also went to film school, <laughs> but uh, I wanted to be a cinematographer, and uh, my passion for photography was always there. But then in film, you, in film school, you go to do some script writing, you do everything, and then we end up doing the, the editing part, and at that time also was all 16 mil, and it was just like being in the dark room, just cutting and splicing, and I fell in love with the process, but I graduated and then joined the union, it was a camera assistant, and I hated being on set. Hated it, and and I felt like uh, I'm I'm not being able to 
to voice is, um, what I feel uh, or add my little grain to the creative process. It was going to take like forever. And that's how I sort of sidetrack and, and went back to editing and storytelling. And that's how I found your happy place. Happy place. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Big time. I also hated being on set. And uh, I knew a lot of divorce directors. <laughs> <laughs> And I was, uh, I was also desperate for a job, and actually, uh, and I just met up with uh, Mark Akbar, uh, who directed a film called *The Corporation* and *Manufacturing Consent*. And uh, it was a yeah. And uh, I needed a job, and Mark needed an assistant editor for making the DVD for *The Corporation*. And they had a, a wall of videotapes as big as that wall over there, and it was about 700 hours of material. And I'm one of two people that went and sat and watched the entire. Uh, back catalog of interviews, and uh, it was like a mini master's degree. And at the end of it, I was like, "Wow, I can do this! This is so great!" And I, you know, I'd been to film school too, and I'd been through that process as a director and worked with editors. And I just, I just had an aptitude, and I just kept going. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, for Susan, you've worked with Adam Agoyan for over 25 years on 12 films. That's a very unique partnership. Can you tell me a little bit about this creative partnership and how it works? How the two of you work together? Well, it has um, it has evolved over the years. Um, it, it's 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 very much obviously Adam and I are now friends. So there's a whole sort of 25 years of personal, you know, life and and life events that we've shared. Um, you know, hit, hit, uh, so that's a really wonderful thing to kind of be in that place with a with an old friend and and kind of rely on catching up on your lives every time he makes a film. Um, but in terms of our creative, so there's a huge trust there as well because of all of that time, and I think that's one of the most important things in a director-editor um, relationship is trust, uh, it, and it goes both ways. It needs I need to know that Adam trusts me to try things, and then I need to trust that the response to those things will will be positive. Even if he doesn't like it, it's not going to shut me down, you know. So I need to feel comfortable that I can try things that may not may or may not work with his work, right? So so that's really wonderful that, that that's there. But in terms of the process, it, it, our process together stems from his process as an artist, fundamentally, which is to, um, he, he likes to, his work evolves in editing before he stops shooting. And he's, he's, he's really enjoyed doing that, and that's an important part of the way he tells stories. So he comes into the cutting room when, when I'm still cutting, when they're still shooting, and he, gets, he wants to move things around, or he wants to try things, and that will influence how he shoots as well as how I'm cutting at that point, which is ch hugely challenging sometimes, but it is his process, and I can talk more about that later, but I don't want to take up too much time, so. Well, that sounds really interesting, and I'm so curious about, you mentioned that there might be things that he might not like, but the way that he gives you feedback doesn't cut you down. Can you talk a little bit about those moments when you butt heads? How, what is your ideal kind of communication in, those, in that type of scenario when you, know, you don't see eye to eye? Well, well, I mean, I think it's always a, a balance. I, I, I'm very aware um, with any director when they come in the room, I already have lots of ideas about what I think works and, and doesn't, but I also know that my notion of that will evolve and change, right? That's one thing. And secondly, the last thing you want to do to a director is, is load them down with a whole bunch of this doesn't work, this is the way you wanted it to, kind of feedback, right? So you, you, you figure out a way to parse that out over the course of an edit, at least I do. So I think that dis the discussion is, I don't know, that's really not working for me, what about this kind of way of, of, of saying things? And then I always also feel like I can do, I can try anything I want with Adam and show it to him. And that's one of the great um, things about uh, cutting on on the way we cut now versus the way we used to, right? Because you can try things. So, but I think it's just a a, a very positive dialogue of of uh, and and it's that great thing that happens when n it isn't one idea or another that prevails, but it's some magic that comes out of both of those ideas. That sounds magical as a process. Um, for the rest of you, I'm so curious. I. So Pretty safe space. You don't have to name names, but have you ever disagreed with a director on an edit? And if you did, how did you solve that issue in that moment? Never. <laughs> you said it's a safe space. Safe fish. Um, working with Daniel, uh, uh, 
he comes from an, uh, you know, he's a film, fantastic filmmaker. He's also an animator, and uh, he brought like a, a new sensibility. Um, if you've seen the film, there's a whole bunch of sequences in it where um, we used se uh, sequences of photos in really rapid succession to kind of create little animations. This is something I've never done in my film. Um, Daniel also is uh, the co-editor of the film, and um, collaborating with him, actually, I, I learned some new techniques. Some, uh, it was really wonderful. So we actually shared a little suite um, here in Toronto, and uh, he would, was on one side of the room, and we were kind of back to back, and we would kind of trade things. And uh, it was actually the first time where I've co-edited a film, uh, and, but I got a lot out of it, and he brought a lot of energy to the whole process. So. I really like how, like a politician, you didn't answer my question at all. <laughs> that was very smooth. For everybody else, is there been a time, I'm just kidding, but has there ever been a time, because I think this is something that people need to learn how to work through when you disagree with a director on an edit and how you work through that process. For me, it's a constant back and forth, and I think uh, the idea is to create that trust and be able to, to feel safe to, to voice, and some of those things will will go and be well received and some will won't at all. And the idea is to, and I've, and I've learned that because at the beginning I was very, very protective of everything that I was doing. I was very proud of a cut and then the director will come and it's like, no, and, and I will be like fighting and then, then it became a, a give, an ego fight. So I have learned uh, not to make it personal, to really understand that I'm there to, uh, to take that vision of the director to a higher place, to, to bring the work uh, to the best possible incarnation. So sometimes um, I'll win some battles and other times I'll, I'll, I won't. And, and the idea is to be able to let go and, and move to the... And sometimes I, I've been shut down, but uh, I noticed that the reaction is to create something better with something that my idea so there's something in that idea yeah. there, but it's like an evolution of that. So I think by not making it personal, it has helped me to at least process it personally. Because otherwise I, I get stuck and then it's just become about like, who has the last say and I'm, I don't have the last say. <laughs> Kelly, I see you nodding a lot. <laughs> you know, I, I have a very different experience because I'm coming from television. I've worked with 43 directors. I counted them a couple weeks ago. And there's only one that I don't care to work with again. So I think that's pretty good. And this was a good director. It's just that I think that we just didn't agree with the approach. So, um, But that being said, um, because I got my start on Breaking Bad, and in television, it's mostly a producer's medium. So I worked with my you know, producer, Vince Gilligan, and Vince Gilligan is an excellent director. So, you know, I got to, on that show, he was very, very, very um, open to going off book and um, letting, he, he basically would say, don't rob me of any riches. So, you know, I get to try things and I get to, you know, throw a lot of things out there and some of them were good, some of them were bad, but some of them were cool and I got to get good at them. So once I came to the Goldfinch, you know, that was a different experience for me because A, it's a feature, B, everybody on this feature is like, look, they all have, I have experience, but not in features. So it's like, I was the new kid. And so I was kind of like, what do I do when I don't agree? And there were times that I did not agree, but I ha it's, it's like I have to learn to, I, I learned how to play a very political game. And that is part of this. Um, what I found though is like, look, the way I look about at editing is we pretty much paint with everyone else's art. The only real art that we don't get, you know, in the original sense is the composers and I guess the sound, the sound editors. Um, but we, everybody else has done their thing and then we kind of get to start painting. And so I have to be very respectful of that, but I also, you know, felt like, look, I'm here to help my director make the movie he wants to make. He is not here to make the movie I want him to make. So in that, um, in a, and I love, like I, I worked with John Crawley and I had such a great time with him. He is so smart and so articulate and so 
he's so on top of the narrative, and this is a very, very dense narrative, and most of our days would consist of talking a lot about, just in conversation, you know, maybe like, maybe two or three hours of conversation, and then, you know, going at the cut in, you know, different ways. Um, and when I would disagree, you know, what I would think, you know, usually is I would try and ask him questions. What do you think the main character feels at this point? Where do you think his head is at? And he would say, hmm, and he would answer me. And I said, well, my feeling is we aren't, I don't have the same feeling as you. Um, and there's why. And how do we kind of come together? And, you know, look, at the end of the day, he can say, well, I don't agree with that. But he wouldn't. He never really did that. So we would really talk it through. And just one last thing that I will say is that I found, I found a lot in all, oh, excuse me, in all my um, editing situations as I started to grow, is that, um, you know, it's, it's all really a compromise. And, you know, again, what you said was like, I'm not going to win, probably. But if you can, are, if you can, like, what am I trying to say? If you, if you as an editor, or if I as an editor, I should say that, if I as an editor can figure out that there is a problem and I can verbalize what the problem is, I mean, it's really hard for anybody to read minds, but if you can say, you know, here's where I think we have an issue, then it's much easier to go at trying to get that. Um, I mean, trying to solve that problem. But if you can't, if you say, so many times I've been with directors, this is not working for me. And then, you know, as an editor, you kind of have to go in and you have to say, okay, and you have to start to get those read between the lines questions. Well, 20 questions, does this not work? Well, are you feeling this, you know? And I find that as an editor, one of my best skills that I've like learned and grown with is how to identify that problem because then we can figure out how to solve that problem. I don't know if you guys have the same thing. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with that. And, and one thing I would um, say too, which comes off something that, that you said, is that I think it's really, really important with features, director-driven, um, that, that I make sure the director understands that I am there to realize his or her uh, vision that I'm not there to say this is I disagree and this is Nina and you did the, you know that fundamentally if I'm disagreeing with the direction the director wants to take it comes from a place of trying to realize their vision and another thing that and and then and then it's just all about making the best movie and then you don't have those headbutting conflicts right you just disagree or agree move on whatever and I think I I often just I think of something that a, the second director I ever worked with in features said to me he said you're the editor, you're my best friend, because you're going to tell me it doesn't work before the movie gets out there and I read it, right? Which is a little simplistic, but generally the idea is there that you have to be, uh, you have to have a thick enough skin to say, you know, I'm going to say these things now when we can deal with it, right? Yeah, that's always my motivation is just trying to make the best thing possible. And uh, I, I think that all editors are, you know, part therapists too. And there's often a dynamic between directors and producers after many years, especially in documentaries, you know. And so sometimes we have to navigate that. Um, but yeah, it, it's, uh, it can be delicate, but, but basically saying right up front, you know, I'm here to make the best thing po possible and to help facilitate. And, you know, but it, it's funny because I think that my process is I'm, I'm very emotionally connected to the decisions that are made. And it is tough at times, you know, when things are like, yeah, let's cut that whole thing out. And you're like, oh, you know. <laughs> Um, but you have to get over that, and you know, so, yeah. Yeah, I think also for me it's a, um, a way to establish a very intimate relationship. I've worked with directors that are extremely protective of their work, and that becomes very difficult because there's like a wall, and you cannot jump that wall. Like unless the director uh, and you create that uh, safe space and that trust, then like the, like the dance begins, otherwise, you become like a mon monkey punching on uh, the keys. And it just becomes very boring, it's, it's not creative. And it, it, this really is about creating that collaboration and taking together risks and this back and forth, back and forth. And if you have like a good director, and not necessarily have to be like a very experienced, I work with directors that are maybe the first feature or second feature and they just trust in the collaboration. 
then you start coming with ideas. You, you start coming with like uh, new possibilities. And but if you if you have like a, a wall at the beginning, then the magic cannot happen. Yeah. No matter how hard you try, it's impossible. I I, I, th I just quickly want to say I, I think there are some also some kind of um, bi business like things you can think about like like how what's your body language like because when you're an editor and I do think about these things you're sitting with the with your back to your collaborator and it's something that's always really bothered me right so I I do remind myself turn around look them in the eye, you know, just so that, or, and I, I will sometimes say, sorry, I, you know, just to make sure that that's, commun and, and it's something that I learned actually from working with assistants and giving them material to cut, and I recommend any editor do this, sit behind them and see what that feels like, and how what they do can bring you in or make you feel uh, that you don't understand what they're doing, because it's very easy to not understand what an editor is doing, especially with the current tools, so that's just a little kind of mechanical thing, but... Well, you guys have uh, yeah. I go just ahead, wanted go to ahead. say one more thing. Um, that one thing that I've like sort of started telling, especially directors and a lot of producers too, is that you know af after after the shooting is done, where everybody is running around trying to make their days, doing all this, you know, and prep is before that, is like really, you know, you're going to spend so much time with your editor, months sometimes. You know, and then you're going to be in one room together for hours. You're going to eat together. We're going to know. And, you know, what I like to tell them is, you know, at the after that, we are your writer's room. I mean, I know this is not, this is features, but it's still kind of the same thing. Now, you know, this is, you could call it, I guess, a rewrite. And we're the right, it's you and me, you know, and, and we're working together. So our relationship has to be you know, I guess, on point, and it has to be safe, and there's all kinds of different, you know, uh, relationship barriers that you're going to work through, but I think that the trust thing and, and the fact that we spend so much time. Yeah, this is especially the case for a documentary. You know, you, you really write the film and the edit, and there's months of that work. I mean, I think there was, you know, maybe a four or five month period, even though it was loosely based on Robbie Robertson's memoir, you know, to lay out his story in a linear way doesn't quite work. Um, you know, the, the film went through many, many iterations. Um, I'm becoming increasingly, um, and I would recommend this, like really tearing scenes down, rebuilding from the ground. You know, there's many th scenes that we had, and we had we took the music out. Music is, can be a crutch, you know, and you can put it in. You can, oh, this scene's great. It's working really well. Pull the music out, recut it, put it backwards. That film, you know, went through, I, don't, I can't even <coughs> begin to imagine how many iterations of it. And it was a really useful process, and I'm, you know, I think when I was younger and I was starting out, I would get really attached to the structure and the way things were working. And uh, the more you can be open to that and just the change and just, you know, and also allowing other people in. Like, this was the first one where, like I said, with, with Daniel, um, we, we collaborated, and, and uh, I just finished a series for um, Amazon as well, and we had, we traded off. And, uh, you know, amazing things can happen when you're open to, you know, collaboration that way with other editors, let alone directors, yeah. You guys have brought up so many different examples. Sorry, sorry, I was just going to jump in. I'm just going to jump in. But no, so I love that this conversation is flowing like this, but you guys have brought up so many great uh, examples of what this is. It's the therapist's office. It's being the politician. It's creating a new writer's room, which is a great example as well, too. I'm wondering in this process, is there any part of it where that never gets easier. That is the hard part. I feel like everyone might have be working in their passion project or their passion job, but there's a part of that job that just never gets easier. Is, is there a part of that? Oh, you're already nodding. Yeah. Okay, you know it. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. I think for me, starting the project, I have a crisis every time I start a project. <laughs> I, have, I have a lot of people that <laughs> sadly can live it with me, and I have all these self, self doubts. I don't know what I'm doing. This material is horrible. Like I'm gonna destroy this film. This this director spent like six years and um all this on and on. And then I survived. And then <laughs> and then the next project comes and I'm in the same place. And there's nothing I can do about it. I do a lot of personal work and that still that still comes up. So yeah, um, basically what he said. <laughs> but you need to tell me the personal work you're doing because I'd like to know that. Oh, tell uh, me that later. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll give you some names. <laughs> I, I'm taking six months off editing right now. So. Are you? Yeah. 
Yeah, I just, uh, I've done a, about four, pro four or five projects back to back to back, and I just need to reconnect, I think, so, yeah. I, you know, I didn't even know how to answer this question, so I'm glad that those guys went first. <laughs> um, I think that probably one of the hardest things is just getting to the point of, especially when the director comes in, look, if I'm okay on my, on my own, but once the director comes in, I don't care what the project is, I'm always like, am I fast enough? Am I, you know, am I going fast enough? Do they, you know? Um, but I will say that whenever I have any doubts, and I mean, look, my biggest fear is creative stagnation. I've done a lot of really creative work, and I've been very proud of that, but I'm scared to death that all of a sudden I'm like, uh. But then I, I sort of, like, jump back to basics. I'm like, okay, Kelly, make a select reel. Make a select. I cut you know, scenes. That, it's like, yeah, just yeah. cut back, back to the building blocks, and then... Um, I have always found that I can usually impress myself. And I'm like the toughest critic of me. Of me. So I'm just like, when I'm like, ooh, look, that looks like somebody else did it, I get very excited. <laughs> I get very excited when that happens. I'm like, oh, man, that looks great. It looks like somebody else did that. Um, so I think that, you know, I guess <laughs> the down and dirty is I get scared um, when, uh, if I'm not, if I feel like I'm not fast enough. But then, yeah, I just kind of like say, Kelly, I know you have good instincts. I kind of talk to myself. Kelly, you have good instincts. You've always had good instincts. Go back to that and forget about everything else. Just, you know, go back and what would you do? What would you do? This is your footage. What would you do? As the technology evolves, you know, you, you, get, you have these tools that allow you to cut faster and faster and faster. And it's incredible. You know, we can turn around a cut. We'll get producer's notes back and we can turn it around in a day. You know, or I can and uh, sometimes. And it's just, you know, you can do a phenomenal amount of work. And um, I, forget, I forget what I was saying. <laughs> we were, what, were we, what were we talking about? Seriously? Yeah. I just, oh, getting fast, being fast for well, producers when well, directors and producers are behind me. Yeah, it's gone. Where am I? <laughs> okay, if it comes back, you can return to it. You okay. can return to it. Uh, I wanted to ask Jorge, you've worked on films in both Canada and Mexico. Is there a different film language in each place? Do you have to switch strategies and processes a little bit? Yes, uh, very much. Uh, I, I started working more in Canada and then going back to Mexico. I'm originally from Mexico. But uh, it was very interesting because going back, I knew that Mexico is in a different time zone. They're in a different like speed. Everything's very relaxed and very, very friendly. And, and I, was, I wanted to bring my Canadianism and structure. And I, I couldn't. And I, I was just like, okay, this is not gonna work here. So I needed to be flexible and adapt to that rhythm and to that um, language, uh, more than the Spanish, just the, 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 cinematic, uh, the cin cinematic language. And, and also then, then get used to it and then come back and get back to the, the more Canadian. So uh, being, being, going back to that, being flexible as an editor, has helped me a lot uh, going back and forth. Uh, but it's also like a, a very great way to change airs, uh, start fresh, and, and yeah, make it more exciting for me, for sure. Definitely, and that's, I don't think that's something that most people are challenged to do, right? It's to change the very culture with which they're doing the filmmaking as well, too. Uh, for Eamon, the documentary, which I got a chance to see and I really enjoyed it, actually. Oh, great. I did, really. Um, it's a mix of new footage and archive footage as well, too. How much footage did you have to sift through and what was that process like? It, well, it was incredible. And what, what was amazing is, you know, we worked with Elliot Landy, who shot all of those iconic photographs and actually some of those photos that are in the final cut um, came in very, very late. Um, and because what we wanted to and what we went for is not necessarily the most iconic shot, but we wanted all the outtakes for these animated sequences. I mean, there was uh, a team of assistants who worked for months just scanning. Like it was, uh, and then all of the footage. I, I, a couple years ago, I did a documentary with Bruce McDonald on uh, the history of music on Young Street called Young Street Rock and Roll Stories. And so I've worked on these, th this, the band's story and Robbie's story specifically. So I actually knew um, what was out there. And from the early period of Robbie's life on Young Street in you know, 1958 to 64, when he went on tour with Dylan, there isn't a lot. And I, I, so I knew that the, you know what existed, and I knew the uh, you know what CBC had, what the NFB had, and what uh, 
you know, the various um, owners of the footage of Toronto in that, that era. So that was pretty easy. What was new to me was, and it was actually kind of an amazing revelation, was um, all of the stuff with Dylan and the band. You know, I'm a fan of Dylan, I'm a, I'm a fan of the band, and uh, I'd say the band is my favorite band. So it was an incredible project for me to work on. Um, but seeing some of the stuff that came out, uh, some of the, there's a, a, an unreleased film from 1964 called Eat the Document of Dylan's uh, famous tour where they got booed off the stage. And seeing the band members, you know, right off Young Street, uh, fresh faced, before the band, you know, they were just Dylan's backup band. That was such a treat for me. Um, you know, hundreds of hours. Uh, I, I couldn't even tell you. Like, I don't think we ever actually tallied it up. But uh, yeah, it, it was uh, a full-time job. And, and then going back and refreshing yourself, you know, about four or six months in, you know, let's go back and let's go and see if we got the best stuff. And oh, lo and behold, there's, you know, something that we've forgotten about or that we missed. And so there was a lot of that. And that was sort of what I was talking about with the iterative process of rewriting and, and finding those gems. And um, yeah, I mean, it was just a mountain. Um, I'm not sure what the, the total number was, but yeah. Yeah, no, that's okay. I mean, I remember there was a, and maybe this is a sound question, I'm not sure, but there is a point, there are several points in the film where it feels like the editing is almost choreographed with the music as well, too. And, and it, I don't know, it was just so exciting to watch it in that way as well, too. Yeah, and that's actually something that Daniel um, really influenced me to, to actually cut in a kind of like rhythmic way with using photos, because we had thousands and thousands of photos. Um, and I remember what I was going to say, you know, when, when I get stuck, this is... <laughs> it's come back. <laughs> Creatively, when I get stuck and I'm, you know, it, and, and I'm having my panic attack, and especially on this film, it was so useful because you have this incredible soundtrack and it happens at strategic moments, you know, like with the music they did with Dylan, um, the music they did post-Dylan, pre-Dylan, it really coincides with an archive. And we knew, I mean, I think there's 35 songs I, roughly in the in the film, and we kind of knew where that was happening. So anytime I got stuck, I would just pick pick a section of the film, and just cut a scene. And you know that got reworked, and maybe it doesn't necessarily work in the final product, but it seemed to sort of clear the way for me and just keep moving and keep it fresh. And so I would do, you know, sometimes you want to watch rushes for you know days, weeks. I like to make sure that I've seen everything, but sometimes you know halfway through that process, I stop and I'll cut a scene. Uh, and that's what I was <laughs> trying to remember. <laughs> so, yeah. You came back to it. You came back to it. Um, all of you spend so much time alone in these dark editing suites in dark rooms. Not dark. Okay. I have a window like this, <laughs> always. It's not dark. It's not dark. Never that's a, is that dark. just like a myth? That's a myth. Okay, the myth has been I, no, destroyed. I, that's what it's, we it was, want. It's not. I, I work, I just, this castle on the ground was, I did it in the basement. Oh. 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 I don't, I don't work in basements. <laughs> I refuse. With the opioid crisis, yeah. it was oh intense. God, that's hard. I, I, it's, it's very common that a producer will be like, yeah, I have this room in my basement. Uh, I want you to stay in there for about six months. No, so I always make sure I have a window yeah. like that. That's, that's how you piss an editor off, is tell them you're going to put them in a room with no window. Well, I was going to ask <laughs> how you stay focused and motivated and positive and healthy in these spaces, but if you have a window, I guess that helps. I don't have a window right <laughs> okay. now, but... Yeah. I don't know what the consensus is, but from everybody I've always talked to, people like windows. <laughs> it's amazing. I think it's a myth, right? It's, you just you know, get rid of that, that solitary dark room. Confinement yeah, I mean, feel. colorists obviously need to be in a dark room, but yeah, creatively, I, 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 I'm not necessarily the most technical editor. I, I, I'm a story editor, really, and I just want to be, you know, uh, have access to the outdoors. It's amazing. <laughs> But how, regardless of if there's a window or not, how do you stay? <laughs> how do you stay focused in this society where there are so many distractions and so many things going on? How do you stay on that path of this is this is the thing that I'm doing? Do you have strategies for that? I used to think that everyone could be an editor, and I used to, you know, people would come and you know ask for my help, and you know, Eamon, how do I become an editor? And I'm like, yeah, sure, you know, let's do this. And I and I do love to mentor people, and I do love to help people. But having that focus, like I can literally sit, I don't know where it comes from, but I can, I'm so engrossed in the process. I can sit from, you know, nine in the morning till six at night or seven at night, um, and sometimes not even eat lunch. Um, I'm sure it's not healthy, I'm sure. Uh, it's not good for my waistline, but um, I, think it's, I think it's something that all editors have. I, it has to be, you have to be focused. And then the speed at which things are happening and the way that you have to turn things around, I mean, it's just, it's a demanding job. But I think that we're all passionate about it and we just find a way to do it. 
Um, we checked out a Reddit thread where people were really upset that you were leaving the series Better Call Saul. They were like angry, super angry <laughs> after you've edited so many episodes. And like, I mean, I don't think that's a usual thing for people to get up in arms about an editor leaving a show. Can you talk a little <laughs> bit about why you think your departure caused such an uproar on, on so Reddit? It's funny. I was talking, I'm, my, I'm here with my friend um, who I've known since college. And um, I was talking about this this morning with him saying, I don't understand. I, I looked myself up the last, I guess the early part of the year, because I wanted to see if there was anything, any press about the Goldfinch, because we finished the Goldfinch before Christmas last year. And wow. and the schedule just, they Warner Brothers had it on the schedule for release this September. So I was like, is there anything going on, right? I don't usually look myself up. But I did so get Google that yourself. Google, and all these people are on Reddit talking about me. <laughs> and I'm like, so I looked it up, and. I don't really understand Reddit. I don't know how to navigate it. So I just kind of clicked around and people were really, really like, like, are, you know, why is she still doing the Better Call Saul podcast if she's not on the show? And I'm just like, why are you people like spending your time chatting about me? Don't um, they know that there were, ed there were editors? No one ever talks about us. Like, <laughs> what's going on? It's just bizarre. I, you know, look, I think that I, I'm always very baffled and perplexed by the amount of visibility that I have. And I think what has added to it was the Breaking Bad Insider podcast. And it, it sort of, you know, let me, I mean, I, it sort of familiarized me and, and people liked the show and they liked that we were doing it and... So, you know, they wanted to, I guess, chat with me a lot or something on Twitter, I guess. So um, I, I, I didn't, I don't think I saw the stuff where they were upset that I left the show. They were mad. But <laughs> I, I hope that that's a good thing. Um, look, here's the thing. I, I, it, what happened with me is I'd been on, I got moved up from an assistant editor on Breaking Bad. My first episode editing was the third episode of the show where if you know, sorry, spoilers, if you know the show, it's where Walt has, or they've, they've bike locked this guy to a pole in the basement. And, you know, it was, I mean, when I read the pilot, I was working for an editor who was my mentor and she was going to direct the, I mean, no, excuse me, edit the pilot. And when I read it, oh, it's going to be this cute, mad, cappy sort of comedy. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. Um, but the thing was is that I went through the whole um, uh, series of Breaking Bad, which was, um, I mean, it was the best job I've ever had, and it was a wonderful experience. And then I went off and did a couple of other things, and I got Better Call Saul going, and I started that. And what I realized right around the end of season two, starting in season three, was that I was sort of stagnating as an editor. I, I wasn't, it was almost like, and this is n nothing against the show because I love those guys and I love those producers and I love all the writing, but I felt like I was sort of now editing the greatest hits. I wasn't really doing anything new. And I had a talk with um, my music teacher's husband, uh, and I'm just gonna plug, he is uh, one of the best trumpet players, one of the best orchestral trumpet players in the world. He is um, uh, uh, the principal trumpet for the LA Phil. And I was talking to him about careers, and he said to me, well, Kelly, what are your dreams? Mm. And it stopped me in my tracks. I was like, wow, it's really come down to that. <laughs> <laughs> How simple. And I, and I kind of like stopped and I said, you know what? I, and I've, I've since passed that on to friends of mine because I said, okay, don't, I mean, look, I was on a great show and I was with them for 10 years, but that wasn't where I wanted to stop. And I realized that a lot of people had gotten their dream being on that show. And yes, I had moved up to editor being on that show, but a lot of people have gotten to showrunners and a lot of people have moved on. You know, there, this was a jumping point for so many people, but I was just kind of like, I'm, this is not where I'm wanting to end. And so I kind of had to make a voluntary break. I literally left the show with nothing. I, I mean, I did not have a job. I hoped to have a job and to tell them, I'm not coming back because I've got this great opportunity and that didn't happen. And what I realized is 
the only way that you can open yourself up for something coming is to you know, let something go. <laughs> And so um, that's what I did. Why these people are mad, I don't know. I mean, there's <laughs> look, there's good, there's good editors there. My assistant, um, who I you know mentored, he's cutting the sh the show now. He's a really great editor. The other editor, Skip McDonald, is a great editor. But I just realized for me, you know, it was time to do something else. It was time to move on. And I got freaking lucky with the Goldfinch when when they called me to do that. Um, actually, they didn't call me. They just called me to read the script. And I said to my agent, come on, man. They're not gonna, come on, do you really think I have a chance to get this? And he's like, yeah, I actually think you do. So I'm like, all right, fine. Send me the script. But I was just glad that I had a great meeting. You know, that usually when I, I have, I'm very lucky that I've had some really great meetings. And usually when I have a good meeting, I'm like, you know what? If I don't get the job, boy, you know, I still had a great meeting. Yeah. So. I'm sorry, I didn't answer your no, question. No, you definitely did. You definitely <laughs> did. I mean, as you guys said, the editors are not people that a lot of the audience generally know, um, and not necessarily the ones that they put on a pedestal and say, that is my editing hero. But for you guys, who are your editing heroes? Who are some of the editors whose style you've really admired or you, you're really enjoying right now? Are there any folks that come to mind or any work that comes to mind? For me, uh, I would say... Jay Cassidy, uh, Dylan Tickner, Stephen Mirione. Um, but basically, it's, it's interesting because there were one time I was asking that question. It's like, okay, what are films that I can remember by the editing? And when I was making that list and then I, I made the connection of who was the editor, they were the same five guys. Same was like, oh, okay, it's clear my style is. Uh, but yeah, because I, I, I knew more names of cinematographers or... or or other group, but and didn't know that much about editing and the names. So Sorry, could you say the films that those editors did? Because I might not know the, them by name, but could you say their films? Yeah. Uh, all the Paul Thomas Anderson, the Alejandro González Eñárritu, the the Wes Anderson, the, 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 the Steven Soderbergh. Uh, those aren't the films. Those are the directors. <laughs> So oh, I was asking for the films that those <laughs> editors that you named had done. So they, you're saying they worked for those they, directors, yeah, they, all their yeah. films. Okay. That's my, I'm doing the translation in my head, yeah. So, <laughs> Amores Perros. Eh, the, oh, yeah, basically all the films by, by these directors. <laughs> <laughs> sort of like that. Yeah. Anybody else for editing heroes? Um... I, there are a lot of editors whose work I admire, but I think that the that's such a tough question because I really admire the work of editors that I don't see the editing, I don't feel the editing. And yet sometimes I'll, I'll see editing that really is clearly, I don't know, it's just hard to answer. Editing that, more, you, you, like you recognize that, that uh, there's a lot of flair in the editing and sometimes I admire that too so uh, there are people whose careers I think I admire but um, I don't I, I, no, I can't answer that <laughs> you know there's a lot happening in television right now um, Handmaid's Tale I just adored that series and the way it was cut uh, Chris Donaldson Wendy Helen Martin you know uh, just it was a real treat to watch that and the risks they took creatively I thought it was just amazing yeah when I was younger, uh, like uh, an assistant editor, I used to collect, the uh, editor friends said I used to collect editors like baseball cards. <laughs> and I knew like so many, and now it's like, when I get asked that question, I'm like. Um, but I will say that one of the best things that I've ever seen still edited is JFK. And those two editors, um, especially Joe Hutching, because he's a friend and, um, I was like, I mean, I don't really get giddy and starstruck about a whole lot of people, but I was like really starstruck because a friend of mine was assisting him and he said, oh, Kelly, he really likes your work. And I'm like, no, you know, <laughs> really, I want to meet him. Um, Joe Hutching, I think, is probably one of my heroes. Um, but, you know, it's funny because I have other heroes that, you know, of closer editors that I know, mostly because they've they're the ones that have taught me the politics and how to handle the editing room. Um, my mentor is Lynn Willingham. She uh, was a longtime editor on The X-Files and um, she cut 
Breaking Bad for two seasons. She cut the pilot, is a two-time Emmy and Ace winner, back-to-back. And um, her husband, Chris Willingham, who is, uh, was an editor, a three-time Emmy winner for 24. Um, those were my early, um, uh, I guess, heroes. And luckily, I know them, and they've taught me so much more just about how to handle the business. I mean, I still make calls going, what should, you know, how do I do this, and you know, stuff like that. What are some of the gems that they've shared with you that you could share with us? On the spot. Um, I don't really know. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be evasive. I don't really know um, how to even answer that because it's usually one of those things where I'm in the editing room and I'm like, my footage is crap. What do I, I this is not going to work. You know, I, I, you know, should I say something? You know, what do I say? This is the footage that they gave me. And I'm, this is not talking about anything in particular. This is 43 directors, like I said. I'm, you know. But it's like one of those things where I'm like going, you know, what do I do? You know, and my one thing that Lynn Willingham has told me over and over again, she's like, look, um, you're, you, bad film makes you a better editor which is like, that's a gem, I guess. Bad film makes you a better editor when you have to like solve problems that you know are there and that's not cutting down any director because all of them have given you, you know, questionable stuff. Um, you know, but it's usually those kinds of things. It's a politics thing that, you know, it's look, I, I, the one thing that I tell a lot of assistants and even other editors is like, look, everybody in town can match everybody. So what are you bringing to the project that is different? What are you bringing? And so look at the film and don't worry about, you know, the the nuts and bolts. Try and, you know, do something, try and put some kind of spin on it yourself. So I guess those are two things that they've said to me before. But usually it's my question is not about editing. My question is usually about handling the room, which I think is something that, you know, we're all learning and evolving. Yeah, many of my early mentors were actually directors. I think editors actually work more with, we, I know more directors than I know other editors, although events like this really you know, help bring us together. And, um, and Nick Hector, who was on the panel last year, uh, is a mentor of mine, and uh, it, it was a lot of navigating difficult situations, and uh, so I, I like to run things by him, as well as you know, other, I've got other friends in the business. And so you, know, you, you reach out to people, what do they like to work with? You know, how do I navigate these certain, you know, certain difficult situations? Um, and yeah, I've been lucky, and, and that's part of the whole thing. Is like if you're if you're up and coming, find a network. You know, don't be afraid to go out and ask people. Uh, informational interviews were really important for me um, along the way. You know, just reaching out to people. I enjoy your work, and the most amazing thing started happening was those people started responding and they knew who I was and they knew my work. And I was like, wow, you know me? Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's incredible. I and, thought uh, of one, can I say? Yeah. Um, the one thing that I was like scared of, um, I had just gotten off my first couple seasons of Breaking Bad, so it was my second or third editing job, and I was freaked, and I called Lynn Willingham. I actually called two other people too, two other editors, and they both said the same thing, and they don't even know each other. And they said, and this works in all professions, that's why I'm bringing it up, is that they said, listen, you need to remember that they hired you because they know all your, your work, so what you need to do is go back to your instincts because that's why they hired you. They're looking for what they know you can bring. So if you're ever like nervous about it, just step back and remember. Don't try and like, you know, like put yourself in a box that you think they want you to be in. Do your they'll, thing. They'll tell you. Yeah, that was the one thing she said. She's like, look, if they want you to do something else, they're going to let you know. So. I just, I, I don't think I answered that original question very well. I've been sit, thinking about it because there are I, lots and lots of editors work whom I admire, but um, Ron Sanders, who's a Canadian editor, and I worked with Ron uh, as an assistant many years ago on the fly and some other things, and he's absolutely a mentor and someone whose <clears throat> work I admire and someone who um, whom I've asked to come and look at stuff that I've cut. Uh, to give feedback, and he's always been hugely supportive, and he's just a really great editor, so. Well, thank you guys so much. This wraps up our panel, but thank you for being so generous and so funny, and it was great to talk to all of you. Can I say one thing? You are like one of the best moderators I have ever seen. Seriously, you are so good. She said she had never done editing. You're really good.
Thank you, everyone.